a CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... famous French detective Eugène Valmont rarely in his brilliant international career came across such an equal as he meets in the story about to unfold. A war of nerves turns into a battle of wits, which I am happy to report to you from the front lines. Jean-Pierre, shine your flashlight onto the desk so that I can examine the papers. And Monsieur Valmont, it's hard to believe Dr. Willoughby could be up to something so underhanded. Are you speaking of Dr. Willoughby, alias the aged messenger, alias Ralph Summertrees? I doubt if he is as innocent as he looks, but let us wait and see what I find here. Our mystery drama, adapted from the classic story by Robert Barr, has been dramatized especially for the Mystery Theater by Gerald Keene and stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We are in England, the late 1800s. An American president has just been elected and the London newsboys are shouting something about the defeat of free silver. A man with deep-set eyes and sharp features, wearing a long cape, buys a newspaper and hurries home. He is Eugène Valmont. I simply could not find a cab in the fog, so I walked all the way to my flat. After dinner, I opened the paper and sat before the fire. The eloquent Mr. Bryan had been defeated in the election. I was sorry to read that. A man with such a gift of words. Uh, come in, Jean-Pierre. What is it? Uh, Monsieur Vernon. Inspector Spencer Hale is here to see you. At this hour? Oh, show him in then. Uh, oui, monsieur. Glad to find you, Ron Valmont. Mind if I shut the door? Of course. It is only the barbaric Americans who leave all the doors in their houses open. But since you make a point of asking, Inspector... I presume you have something of a very confidential nature to discuss. I would say so. A totally unnecessary precaution. Uh, my man, Jean-Pierre, is also my assistant. When I decided to retire from the service, he asked to retire with me. Uh, do sit by the fire, Inspector. Uh, I uh, see you're reading the evening paper. I'm glad that man Brian was defeated. <laughs> These Americans, such strange people. Of course he was defeated. A millionaire running for the presidency in a democracy where the average voter is as poor as a French peasant. Now, what uh, important matter has brought London's chief inspector to my poor apartment on such a night? Hello, Mom. You're a clever man. So when I tell you the question which has brought me here tonight is the same on which the American election was fought, I know I need say no more. Free silver, Inspector? Yes, entirely too free. Uh, tell me, dear friend, have they eluded you? Who? Why, the counterfeiters. I'll be. Oh, on, that was just a lucky shot. Perhaps. Well, tell me how you guessed it. <laughs> Very simple, mon ami. The question on which the American election was fought was the price of silver, which is so low it ruined William Jennings Bryan. Silver troubles America, ergo silver troubles Scotland Yard. It is not the theft of silver, but the price of silver, the very low price. Ergo, someone must be counterfeiting British coins and making a large profit. Well, Mon, you've hit it. I'll say that for you. Bang it right on the noggin. You see, there's a gang of expert counterfeiters who are putting out real silver money and making a clear shilling on every half crown. I gather you do not know who the counterfeiters are. No, but we know the man who's shoving the stuff. So you go from A to B and find out. So far, no luck. Which is why I've come to see you tonight. 
to see if you would do one of your old French tricks for us on the quiet. Uh, and what French tricks, Monsieur Hale? Oh, oh, no offense intended. <laughs> and uh, I need someone to go to a man's house without a search warrant. Spot the evidence. Let me know. I know we'll rush the place before he's had time to hide the goods. Oh, I see. Who is this man and where does he live? Well, his name is Ralph Summertrees. And he lives in a very posh four-story in Park Lane. And why do you suspect him? Park Lane is an expensive district to live in. Now, this summer tree has no ostensible business. Yet every Friday, he goes to the United Capital Bank in Piccadilly and deposits bags of silver coins. And they are, of course, the real thing, not counterfeit. Naturally. But it's no great problem to go around London with a pocket full of counterfeit fine shilling pieces, buy this, that and the other, get the change, and come home with legitimate coin. Why don't you nab him on his way out when he's got a pocket full of counterfeits? Well, we sure that. But we want to land the whole gang. And if we arrest him for passing, who's ever doing the counterfeiting will escape. And you know for certain this summer field... The summer tree. Uh, yes, that he is not the counterfeiter. Well, uh, of course you do. You've got one of your own men working in his house. Unfortunately, your man has not come up with any evidence. Uh, you have it again, Ramoff. I've got a man uh, called Podgers working his butler there, but... Uh, he has come up with nothing, huh? Tell me, how does the money get to this uh, summer trees in Park Lane? It's brought there every night by a man who looks like an elderly, respectable city clerk. He puts it in a large safe in the dining room on the ground floor. Have you had the clerk followed? Oh, well, certainly. Oh, what do you take us for? Now, according to Pardes, he sleeps every night in the Park Lane house and in the morning goes to an antique shop in Tottenham Court Road, spends the day there, and every evening returns to Park Lane with a bag of money. And you would rather not arrest and question him either. Hmm? Well, for the same reason. He's merely a messenger. What go will it do to put the go-betweens in the clink, letting the real criminals escape? Hmm. Nothing suspicious about the antique shop? There's nothing we can discover. Then let us see what I can discover. Uh, do you happen to have a counterfeit five-shilling piece on you? Uh, yes, I do. Ah, good, give it to me. I may be able to put it to good use. Oh, my... It certainly is a faithful reproduction. Uh, using pure silver, these counterfeiters can make a fine shilling piece for practically nothing. I mean, the actual silver is worth no more than six pence. Oh, fancy that. Uh, now, to get back to your suspect, Summer Lee... That man is Summer Tree. Yes, of course, that's what I meant. But uh, does he have any, uh, any women servants in his house? No, all men. A butler, a valet, and a French cook. Oh, no, a French cook. <laughs> this case begins to interest me. Mm, real French cooking. You know, I might take your man Podger's place and play the butler, since I gather he has not discovered anything. Oh, he's done a good job. Everything a man can do. Naturally, he doesn't have your experience. <laughs> uh, now, what does this summer field do all day? Well, Podger thinks he's a writer. Locks himself up from morning till evening in study. Doesn't he come out for lunch? Now he has a hot plate in study. Makes his own coffee, has a little pan tree, and has a sandwich. Well, pretty frugal fare for Park Lane. Oh, he makes up for in the evening when he has a long dinner with all those fine dishes your people eat, done up by his French cook. Sensible man. I must tell you, Inspector, my opinion of your suspect has been gradually rising, and at the same time, my estimate of your ponchos has been steadily declining. However, bring the man here tomorrow, and I will ask him a few questions. Monsieur Vermont, this is Sergeant Podgers. How do you do, sir? Uh, Podgers, has this man, Summer Trees, ever stopped you from entering any of his rooms in Park Lane? Uh, no, sir. He's been quite open with me, you might say. Last Friday, he went to the safe took out the money, had me count every shilling and sent me to the bank to deposit, sir. 
true deposit, say. Hmm? Yeah, what do you think of that, Valmont? Well, frankly, I think he has seen through Podger's disguise and been very sure the scheme is amused by the masquerade. Uh, now then, Podger, about this aged clerk, he arrives every day with the money at uh, what time? At prompt six, sir. Does he ring or let himself in with a latch key? With a latch key. Hmm. How does he carry the money? In a locked leather satchel, sir. And you have seen him go directly to the dining room, unlock the safe, and put in the money? Yes, sir. So, it is the aged clerk who unlocks the leather money bag? Yes, sir. Let me see. That is three keys used within as many minutes. Did you ever see Mr. Summertrees with this bunch of keys? For instance... The time he opened the safe and you counted the money and took it to the bank, what key did he use? I don't remember, sir. Hmm. Once the money is in and the safe locked up, what does the clerk do? Goes to his room, sir. Where is it? On the third floor. Where do you sleep, Podgers? On the fourth floor. The rest of the servants. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Summertrees? On the second floor, adjoining his study, sir. The house consists of four stories and a basement, and you have gone through it all? Yes, sir. And you can let me in so that I can make an examination? Oh, yes, sir. Thursdays is the help day off, and Mr. Summertrees is always locked in his room, sir. I never disturb him. Podger, you are a sharp, alert, observant man. Well, thank you, sir. What happens that strikes you as uh, unusual? I can't. Rightly say, sir. Call to mind some of the other households in which you have been an undercover man. Is there any way in which Mr. Summertree's establishment differs from them? Well, sir, he does stick to his room, writing pretty close. Mm -hmm. Anything else, no matter how trivial? He seems fond of reading, too. These ways, he's fond of newspapers. He takes all the morning and evening papers. Hmm. And what is done with them after he has read them? Well, they're sold to the ragman, sir. Uh, once a week. Well, do they appear to have been read carefully? Anything cut out of them? Mm, not that I could see, sir. Oh, I can't see what the man's reading habits have to do with anything. Oh, a great deal. Uh, Potter, today is Wednesday. Tomorrow morning, I would like you to bring here to my assistant, Jean-Pierre, whatever newspapers you have gathered this week to be sold. Oh, well, Mon, what's all this mystery about the newspapers? Mystery? Au oh, contraire, Inspector. I would say the entire case is perfectly plain. What's perfectly plain? Your suspect, Summertrees, is not a counterfeiter. Nor is he in any way connected with counterfeiters. Well, what is he then? Something far more interesting. And, and, and that is what I plan to find out. <laughs> As the great Sherlock Holmes would say, Hello, what have we here? Obviously, his French counterpart, Eugène Vermont, has an unusual analytical mind. I'll admit to you, he's several steps ahead of me. Where those steps lead, I hope we shall discover when I return shortly with Act Two. and alert is a hunting dog when his senses tell him his prey is not far off. Our Eugène Vermont has picked up a scent, but where does it lead? To whom? A fox? A wolf? Perhaps a man disguised in sheep's clothing? The following day, our French detective arrives at the Park Lane house. Policeman Podgers leads him to the third floor. And, uh, this, I take it, is the room where the aged clerk who delivers the money spends his evenings. And nights. Yes, sir. I advised you to come here today, Monsieur Valmont, because I accidentally opened the study of Mr. Summertrees, and he's not there. I'm sure he'll be out for quite a few hours. Ah, good. Now, to make a thorough search. Uh, what are you looking for, sir? Uh, an escape hatch. You tell me that this clerk arrives with the money, puts it in the safe, goes up to this room, remains here all evening or night, 
and leaves in the morning. Uh, quite right, sir. Oh, don't you find it peculiar he should arrive at six and go to bed hungry? No dinner? Oh, I never thought of that, sir. Yes. And you never told me what he looked like, either. The clock, sir? Uh, quite old. Gray hair, gray beard. Yes, and your master of summer trees. How would you describe him? We're a younger man, quite clean shaven. Uh, that's the closet door you're tapping on, sir. Yes, I know it is. And I shall go inside the closet and continue tapping. Ah, there must be a latch here somewhere. Huh. Why would anyone hang a pair of trousers on a hook back here? Now, suppose we give this hook a little twist. Good Lord, sir. The panel in the back of the closet is moving. So it is. Potters, I want you to go down one flight into Mr. Summertree's study and wait there for me. Now, sir? The sooner, the better. Potters. Potters, are you there? Mr. Valmont. How did you get down the end of Mr. Summerfield's closet? I walked down, Potters. There are two closed closets, one directly above the other, and behind them a connecting secret stairs. You see why this would be useful, Pajel. Not entirely, sir. The aged messenger who has all the keys puts the money in the safe, then goes up to his room on the third floor, into the closet, back down the secret stairs to the second floor closet, removes his beard, changes clothes, and so forth, and becomes who he really is, Mr. Summer trees. He has an excellent dinner prepared by an excellent French cook, and the next morning he reverses the procedure, becomes the aged messenger, and goes off to this shop on Tottenham Court Road. Potters, I fear you've been watching empty rooms on the second and third floors, and a suspect who wasn't in them for over two weeks. Well, how did... Uh, why would he do all that? There is a great deal of safety in a one-man operation. The following day, Friday, my assistant Jean-Pierre and I stood outside a certain antique shop in Tottenham Court Road, gazing at the bric-a-brac in the window. <laughs> Look at the trash people sell as antique. No worse, Jean-Pierre, than what people will buy. Uh, did the rather stout Sergeant Potter deliver a parcel of newspapers this morning? Ah, yes, he brought them for you. Uh, not for me, Jean-Pierre, for you. When we return home, I would like an analysis and a full report by tea time. Ah, oui, monsieur. Now, shall we go inside the shop? Ah, what can I do for you, gentlemen? There is a small clock my friend and I saw in your window, uh, standing on a big seashell and covered with little seashells. Uh, tell me, how much is it? Uh, seven and six, sir. Shall I get it out so you can have a look at it? By all means. Uh, get it out and wrap it up. We shall buy it. Uh, Jean-Pierre, do you happen to have any uh, small change about you? Uh, I'm afraid I don't. Uh, nothing smaller than a five-pound note. Oh, well, then, uh, here's a sovereign, my good man. Twenty shillings. Do you mind the change being all in silver? Uh, no, not in the least. Uh, here we are, sir. I think you'll find that correct. Thank you. Uh, intriguing place you have here, sir. Uh, may I inquire your name? Uh, Willoughby. Anything else that uh, strikes your fancy? Well, suppose we browse a bit and have a look around. Uh, by all means, by all means, the shop is yours, gentlemen. Now, wrap up your seashell clock, if you'll excuse me. Uh, but, uh, take your time, take your time. Come here. Did you see that young man who just came into the shop? I did. He went directly to the back room and this uh, will be right after him. Mm. Let me inspect the silver he gave me in change. Uh, half a crown, three two-shilling pieces. One, two, three, four separate shillings. Champion, how do they look to you? Well, I would say badly enough made to be the real thing from the British means. <laughs> Agreed. So we know he is not palming off counterfeit money. When he returns, we'll buy something small and give him the inspector's counterfeit five-shilling piece and see how he reacts to that. Uh, this young man who just came in. He is leaving, going out the door. Uh, gentlemen, 
So you found anything else that uh, caught your eye? Yes, this little ink stand. How much is that? Two shillings. Ah, oh, do take it out of this. Five shillings. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. Oh, uh, do excuse me, will you? Um, I shall. I shall be right back. Jean-Pierre, another young man. Quite a bit of traffic to the back room. At any rate, I'm assured my first conclusion was correct. He took the coin without blinking, so it is highly unlikely anything of a counterfeit nature goes on here. Jean-Pierre, I'm going to move toward the front door. While our shopkeeper is engaged, I'm going to make a wax impression of the key. Should he return unexpectedly, uh, detain him. Over by the door is a pile of what looks like pamphlets ready to be mailed. I think I'll help myself to one. Did you make the key impression? I did. Did you secure the pamphlet? I did. I, I can see through that back door. The young man is getting up to leave, Mr. Willoughby. A good time for us to go also. You have the purchases. gone over all the newspapers Sergeant Podgers left here. Each one is more or less the same, the, the usual advertisements of pills and soap and so forth. Aside from that, there is one kind of advertisement common to all these papers. It says it can cure absent-mindedness. Well, let me show you, monsieur. Are you absent-minded? There is no need to be. You can cure confusion and forgetfulness. Apply by mail for our template. List your personal hobby. No fee, no treatment, no risk. You lose nothing. You may gain peace of mind. Dr. Stanford Willoughby, 1414 Tottenham Court Road, London, WC1. Uh, this is one of his pamphlets I picked up at the shop. At the back it says, uh, Dr. Willoughby will neither see patients nor correspond personally. Read and learn. You need not be absent-minded. The good doctor has just secured another patient. I shall write to him that I am very absent-minded, that my hobby is, uh, is, uh, what shall I say, Jean-Pierre? Uh, collecting rare books. Excellent. Rare first editions. And I sign my name. Uh, what was the name that we used on the Milburn murder case? Uh, uh, Al Port Webster, sir. You were Al Port Webster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you still have the calling card with that name on it to slip onto my mailbox downstairs? Uh, I'll attend to it. Uh, there was something else I had on my mind to report to you. What would it be? Uh, the key. Did you give me the key? Ah, that's it, of course. Here it is. I finished an hour ago from your wax impression. Now, let me see. I'll put Webster, card on mailbox, letter to Willoughby, key to shop. Oh, what have I forgotten? Ah, the rum in the tea. I forgot that. <laughs> you know, Jean. It occurs to me we are both getting a bit forgetful. Perhaps Dr. Willoughby will teach us more than we hoped for. Good morning, Monsieur Valmont. Good morning, Jean-Pierre. Uh, there is a Mr. Angus McPherson outside. He's come to see a Mr. Alport Webster. Uh, here. There is his card. <laughs> so soon, Mr. Webster has a visitor. Uh, Jean-Pierre, show the gentleman in. You may come in, sir. Mr. Webster, how kind of you to receive me. Your card reads Angus McPherson, rare book. Now, in what can I serve you? Uh, these three books I put before you. Are you interested at all in first editions, Mr. Webster? It is the only thing I am interested in. But, unfortunately, they often run into a lot of money. Aye, <laughs> that's true. Uh, these three do run into some money. Uh, this one it costs 100 pounds. However, it is an excellent value. The last one sold at auction here in London for £150. Uh, this book is £40, and this one £10. I'm sure, Mr. Webster, you could not duplicate three such treasures at these prices in any bookshop in Britain. Oh, yes. Quite extraordinary. Beautifully got up. Excellent condition. How, sir, for instance, did you learn that I was a collector? <laughs> Ah, Mr. Webster, I must confess, I chanced it. I do that very often. 
I enter a flat like this at a good address, send in my card to the name on the mailbox, and if I'm invited in, I ask what I ask you. Are you interested in rare editions? Then if he says no, I leave. If he says yes, then I show my book. Mr. McPherson, since this is the first time you have called upon me, you have no objection if I ask the name of the owner of these books. Who oh, his name is Mr. Ralph Summertrees of Park Lane. I shall be glad to leave the books with you and come back tomorrow when you've made up your mind. Oh, no, no, no. It is rather a question of money. I was going to tell you. I have a very good friend. And when people find it inconvenient to put down a considerable sum... He pays for the books. Then I make an arrangement with my customer to pay a certain amount each week, installments small enough to suit the client. Suppose I take the book at ten pounds. What installment should I have to pay each week? What you like, sir. Would five shillings be too much? I think not. Done, then. If you pay me five shillings now, I will leave the book with you and will call on you this day each week for the next installment. Good enough. Uh, here you are, five shillings. Ah. Until Wednesday next, then, Mr. Webster. A pleasure. Uh, Jean-Pierre, I'll have my man to show you out. Uh, Jean-Pierre, show Mr. McPherson out. Good day, sir. Yeah, and thank you. And happy reading. You, you've got a treasure there. Very fine indeed. Good to red mark or leather, no less. Ah, uh, uh, Jean-Pierre, has uh, our Mr. McPherson left? He has, monsieur. Oh, is that a book you want, sir? No, Jean. It is cheese for our mousetrap in a most exquisite binding. <laughs> Unquestionably, Eugène Dalmore is uncovering a swindle. How it works, who works it, who gains, who loses, are all questions to which you have every right to expect answers. But since when have I ever disappointed you if you remain tuned in for Act 3? I'll be back shortly. Some people live by bending the golden rule. Others would melt it down if they could. Chicanery had been going on for centuries. Even Samuel Johnson warned, saying, If a man really believes there's no difference between virtue and vice, why, sir, when he leaves my house, I count my spoons. Good advice, it seems to me. Today, as it was 200 years ago. Jean-Pierre, point your flashlight over here, over the desk. I want to go through it. Hmm. Nice little antique shop, this. So innocent with its seashell clocks, it's hard to believe Dr. Willoughby could be up to anything underhanded. Dr. Willoughby, alias the aged messenger clerk, alias our summer fleet. Fleet, uh, sir. Alias, goodness knows how many other people. No, no, this is not an innocent store by far. Ah. Will you look at this collection of calling cards? Mm. Angus McPherson, rare coins. Angus McPherson, jewels to the connoisseur. Fine furniture, cards for other accomplices as well. Uh, Mr. Rogers, Mr. Tyrrell, and these sheets. <laughs> Mr. Tyrrell's list, Mr. Carmody's list, Mr. McPherson's list. Uh, there I am, Allport Webster, owing ten pounds weekly payments, five shillings. Except for the calling cards, these sheets are no evidence of wrongdoing, however. Merely a record, names of clients. Ah, don't care. I am disappointed. A legitimate record of collections. Ah, too bad. Well, I'll have a look at one of those ledgers on the shelf overhead. Ah, now, this may be something. This is friend McPherson's account going back several years. 1896, 5, 4, 1893. Well, let's see who his clients were then. Mm -hmm. There is Lord Symptom. I know the gentleman. Absent-minded old conjurer. See page 47. 47. Hmm. Lord Symptom. 
purchased Chippendale wing chair, 50 pounds. Jean-Pierre, look, look here. Look here, Lord Symptom has been paying a pound a week for that chair for more than three years. Look at this. His lordship has already paid in installments 170 pounds. Ah, that's it. That is it. <whistles> Look at these names of collectors. This summer tree has been employing a half dozen collectors who take in weekly installments from these absent-minded buyers long after the debts are paid. I'll take this page of Lord Symptom's account and copy out some names and addresses of friend Angus's present clients, and then we'll be off. Yes. Costly business, buying on the installment plan. Eh? Yes. Especially if you're absent-minded. Vermont, I got your message. Why are we meeting here in Trafalgar Square? If one has secrets to divulge, the most public place is the most private. That's what we were taught in the Paris to say. Well, so what is it? You say you already have evidence against the man. Evidence absolute and complete. Well, then who are the counterfeiters? My dear Hale, I have told you since the beginning that Summer Trees was neither a counterfeiter nor a confederate. But I believe I have evidence sufficient to convict him of quite another offense, which is probably unique in the annals of crime. Inspector, I would like you to come by to my flat next Wednesday at about a quarter to six, prepared to make an arrest. I should like to stand behind the door, so when it opens, voila, this study of mine will be in complete darkness, except for a light which will shine on you. A bit like here to what? <laughs> so, when the young MacPherson fellow enters, he will immediately see you towering there, full height in your official uniform, a frightening sight to behold. Oh, thank you. You see, Hale, I am anxious to study MacPherson's face when he realizes he has walked in to confront a policeman. Oh, what time is it? One more minute and our friend will be here to collect his five shillings for the book I purchased. Mr. Angus McPherson. Ah, show him in, Jean-Pierre. Hell, stand quite still in that light. Excellent. Oh, I, uh, I beg your pardon. I had expected to meet Mr. Webster. Come in, come in, McPherson. Oh, there you are, Mr. Webster. I didn't see you at first. Uh, sit down, uh, McPherson. You have called on Lord Sempton this week. Aye, uh, sir. And collected a pound from him? Uh, yes, sir. Three years ago in October, you sold Lord Sempton a Chippendale wing chair for 50 pounds. Quite right, sir. When you were here last week, you gave me Ralph Summertrees as the name of the gentleman who owns the books living in Park Lane. You knew at the time this man was your employer. You also knew that this summer trees of Park Lane was identical with Dr. Willoughby of Tottenham Court Road. I don't exactly see what you're driving at, sir. It's quite usual for a man to carry on a business under an assumed name. There's nothing illegal about that. We will come to the illegality in a moment. You and Rogers and Tyrrell and three others are confederates of this Dr. Willoughby. Uh, we are in his employ. But no more confederates than clerks usually are. I think, McPherson, I have said enough to show you that the game is what you English call up. You are now in the presence of Mr. Spencer Hale of Scotland Yard, who is waiting to hear your confession. Uh, confession? Confederates? I must say, he is extraordinary terms. What have you to say in your defense? Where nothing criminal has been alleged, I see no necessity for defense. If you will be good enough to let me know of what you complain, I shall endeavor to make the point clear to you. I show you this ledger sheet. Have you ever seen it before? Oh, yes. It's been taken from our file. It's what I call my visiting list. Oh, come, McPherson. Why continue this charade? We all know about it. You never heard of Dr. Willoughby, I suppose. Oh, yes, yes. He's the author of a silly pamphlet on absent-mindedness. You are right. Have you ever met this learned doctor? Oh, yes. Dr. Willoughby is the pen name 
of Mr. Sometree. Really? Well, we are extracting your confession bit by bit. And at first, I think it would be far better if you were honest with us. If you tell me what the charge is, I will then know what to say. We charge you, sir, with obtaining money under false pretenses. A crime that has landed the biggest financiers in jail. No, Valmont, we mustn't threaten, mustn't threaten, you know. Take, for instance, Lord Semptum. You sold him a chair for 50 pounds on the installment plan. He was to pay a pound a week, and in less than a year, his debt was liquidated. But he is an absent-minded man, as are all your clients. So, you kept on collecting and collecting for more than three years. Now, do you understand the charge? <laughs> what you tell me is really a clever little scheme. The absent-minded league, one might call them. More than genius. I quite see how you could make such a mistake. You have jumped to the conclusion that we sold nothing to Lord Septum except a Chippendale chair three years ago. However, his lordship is a frequent customer of ours and has had many things from us at one time or another. We keep a sort of a uh, running contract with him by which he pays us a pound a week. Are you telling me that all your customers deal on the same plan? You keep selling and they keep paying? Uh, that uh, visiting list on your desk, Mr. Valmont, is incomplete. To understand it, you must refer to our business encyclopedias. Hey, take Lord Septum. His account is the number 102. Turn to that page of the encyclopedia of 1893. And you will see a list of all the items his lordship has purchased. Ah, if you will allow me to use your telephone for a moment, I will ask Mr. Sometries to bring you the encyclopedia for 1893, and in 15 minutes, you will be satisfied that everything is legitimate. And may I use your phone? Well, in just a moment, I'll do the telephone. What's his number? Uh, Hyde Park 140. Hello, Central... Get me Hyde Park 140, please. These encyclopedias contain the real secret of our business and are kept in Mr. Summertree's safe. Uh, is this the resident of Mr. Summertree's? Oh, is that your Padres? Is Mr. Summertree's in? Oh, very well. This is Ayo. I'm in Belmont's flat. Yes, yes, where you were the other day. Very well. Now go to Mr. Summertrees and say to him that Mr. McPherson wants Encyclopedia of 1893. To get that. Oh, yes, yes, he'll understand what it is. Oh, Mr. McPherson wants it. Right. No, 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 don't mention my name at all. Just say that Mr. McPherson wants it and that you're to bring it. And you get into a cab and come here as quickly as possible. We're, we're waiting. Uh, of course, Inspector Hale, you know your business best. But if your man arrests summer trees, he'll make you the laughing stock of London. Now, while we're waiting, uh, Monsieur Valmont, may I remind you you owe me five shillings this week's installment? Of course. Uh, here you are. Are you connected with Scotland Yard, Monsieur Valmont? No, not at all. Ah. Well, I can't think of anything else to say to pass the time. Uh, I suppose we shall just have to sit back and wait. Bodgers, oh, give me the book. Let's see. The Encyclopedia of Sport, 1893. What sort of joke is this, McPherson? Oh, no. I might have known this had happened. If you'd allowed me to telephone, I should have made it perfectly clear to Mr. Summertrees what we wanted. There's an increasing demand for out-of-date books on sport, and he thought this is what I meant. Uh, there's nothing for it but to send your man back to Park Lane and tell Mr. Summertrees we wanted the lock volume of accounts of 1893. <laughs> Yes, this is Monsieur Valmont, President. Oh, yes, Mr. McPherson's here. What? I, I 
Akanenge. At a print. The Encyclopedia for 1893 is at a print. What the... Wait, wait, who is here speaking? Dr. Willoughby? Hello. Hello. Oh, he's running off. Hey, stop him. Stop uh, it, Johnson. Uh, what? What's he done? He took that sheet from the ledger and threw it into the fire. He's destroyed evidence. Matt Thurston, how dare you burn that sheet? Because, my dear Monsieur Valmont, it did not belong to you. Because you stole it. Because you had no right to it. And because you have no official standing in this country. I have always maintained these sheets and ledgers should not be kept. Mr. Summertrees, however, persisted. But he made this concession. If I ever telephoned him the word encyclopedia, he would at once burn those records. When done, he was to telephone back to me the words, the encyclopedia is out of print. Now, gentlemen, either put me formally under arrest or see me to the door. This farce is now over. Ah, a very good evening to you, Inspector Hale. And a good evening to you, Monsieur Eugene Valmont. I shall give myself the pleasure of calling next Wednesday at six for my five shillings. Believe it or not, the inspector from Scotland Yard and the retired detective from the French Sûreté are still friends. However, there is one certain case they never talk about. Nor do the words absent-mindedness or counterfeiting ever come into their conversation. And if one of them happens to say every cloud has a silver lining, the other turns pale. I shall be back shortly. In the world of the wicked, a certain kind of swindle is regarded as a very great act, the one that's foolproof. And the greatest artist is the one who takes the least risks. I dare say among the hundreds of tales of rogues and knaves I brought you on the mystery theater, this is the first in which flim flam flourishes. I hope it is the last. Our cast included Norman Rose, Robert Dryden, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. The spirit, having achieved the ultimate understanding, leaves the body and tries to become one with the universe. Leonard, I'm drowning. But the time is not yet, and so it must be born anew in another body. Leonard, is this you? Bridges, I am finally free. I know at last. I know. The guru showed me who I am. Who are you? I have been born again, recreated, although uh, realistically I never died. Yeah? Once again I walk the world, I think, I dream, I create. But who are you? That is, who do you think you are? Oh, I know who I am. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Leonardo da Vinci. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.